Thanks so much. Please keep that passage open and let me add my welcome to John. It's great to see you here today. And hello if you're on the live stream as well. And we're looking at this passage where Jesus goes for dinner. Now, just even that introduction ought to make you nervous. If you know anything about Jesus at dinner parties, he was usually quite embarrassing. And I think I, I found three times in Luke's gospel where Jesus goes to dinner with a Pharisee. And this is the one that goes best, just to warn you. It kind of, it's kind of downhill from here. I'll just give you a flavor of how it, how it ends up. So um, uh, later on, while Jesus was speaking, a, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And he went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus didn't wash before dinner. Doesn't wash his hands before he eats. And so they're, they're sort of judging Jesus. And then he says, you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. So that dinner party doesn't go very well. And then um, a little bit later on in chapter 14, uh, Jesus goes um, to dinner with the Pharisee. And they watch him to see whether he's going to heal someone on the Sabbath. And, uh, and, he, and he does. And they judge him and they want to kill him as a result. So dinner parties with Jesus are awkward. And I think that's to, to understand that we need to know that who you invite to dinner um, and how you behave at dinner is kind of a sign of whether you welcome someone, how you feel about someone. Now, that, I think that's true in every culture. And it's true in the Bible. It's why I'm really chuffed that we're having these link up lunches where John I mentioned them earlier where you can sign up either to host a meal or to invite someone to a meal and the best thing about the, the link up lunch is you don't really get to choose who you have I don't know if you work that out you just say I'm free to host on this day and then Michaela just matches you with someone who wants dinner on that day and you don't get to decide who it is and that's the kind of lovely thing as a Christian to do but it's not really how dinner parties work usually people invite the people that they like the people that they think aren't going to be embarrassing, uh, the people who are going to behave correctly. Um, and then it turns out that there's this whole business of etiquette that governs whether or not you're really kind of on the inside track or whether you've done the right thing. Now, um, I know the English etiquette, and we do have some really very silly rules, and it only really applies if you go to a very posh dinner. And it, these, none of these things will be required if you go to one of the link-up lunches at Grace Church Greenwich. But for example... Um, it turns out that when, when you're served peas and you have a knife and a fork, um, instead of spooning them with the fork into your mouth, you're supposed to stab each individual pea with a different prong of the fork. I never realized this because I wasn't brought up in a sort of posh background. But then the first time I went to a smart dinner and I saw people individually spearing their peas, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't fit in because I'm not doing the right thing with my peas. And it turns out that you're then meant to make a little platform out of the peas, and then on the back of that platform, you stack everything else at the back of your fork. Some of you are looking at me at bewilderment. This is what you have to do if you go to a posh dinner. And if you don't do it, everyone says, did you see what he's doing with his peas? And they sort of shake their head. And in, inwardly, they're, they're judging you. Or another thing is if you're served cheese, and you get some French cheese, like a soft, big wedge of brie, and you, you're the first person to cut some off, and then if you cut the end off the brie, like the pointy bit, that's called cutting off the nose. And it's extremely rude. And everyone's like, I can't believe they she cut off the nose of the brie. You see, there's all these sort of special little rules that you have to know. And actually, it's not just, I mean, these are ridiculous things, aren't they? And I can make fun of my own culture. But there are apparently, and I looked on the internet, there's all sorts of things in other cultures as well. I don't know whether these are actually true because I found them on Google. So if you're actually from this culture, you can tell me. But apparently in China leaving your chopsticks standing upwards in the bowl is very rude because that's how ceremonial rice is left at funerals. I can't believe he's referencing. Is that right, Janice? I can't believe that they're referencing a funeral. And you just thought you were just leaving your chopsticks behind. Uh, you know, there's um, uh, apparently in Thailand, it's very rude to eat with a fork because the only point of the fork is to push the food onto the spoon and then you eat the spoon. I, I don't know if this is right. But the point is you can see what a minefield it is because when you're invited to dinner, even though you think you're being welcome, there's all these sort of things that decide whether you're actually in or not. And you might think you're there as a guest and everyone's judging you for not fitting in. Of course, it was a big thing in the history of the Bible because there were all sorts of food laws that God himself designed uh, that meant that Jewish people couldn't easily eat with Gentile people, rules about kosher. Um, and I guess it's the same with Muslim friends with rules about halal. 
And so it's difficult just to eat together. And these dining customs, they just sort of signal who's like us and who's not. And the people who are not are not really welcome. We don't want people who are not like us. Um, how common, how vulgar, how weird. Now, th this is the background to this dinner party in Luke chapter 7, because Jesus is very embarrassing. I mean, he's embarrassing at all dinner parties that he's invited to, but at this one he's embarrassing because of who he is comfortable welcoming that everyone else finds a bit shocking. So um, Jesus goes to dine at this Pharisee's house. I guess it's quite a smart house, and they're sitting down at the table, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, I guess, I mean, we're all sinners, but I guess this means she's got something of a reputation as a sinner. She's a notorious sinner. We're not told exactly what, but um, is she a prostitute? Maybe. Um, she's someone that everyone slightly disapproves of. And she comes to dinner, and everyone's like going, oh, what, you know, what, what's she doing here? In, in that kind of, she's, she's not really one of us. How, how awkward that she gate crashed this posh soiree. But um, not only that, it actually gets worse because she hears that Jesus is there and so she comes and brings a big flask of perfume and then stands before Jesus weeping and then wetting his feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair and kissing his feet and pouring perfume over them. I mean, Maybe you know the story, and so we're, we're kind of so used to it that we forget how shocking this is. But imagine, I've got some people coming for dinner today after church, and if you haven't got any plans, you're welcome to join us. I've got extra food. But if someone started behaving like this, I guarantee the rest of you would be embarrassed. <laughs> imagine, so I'm sort of crying and then I'm um, getting out my feet. I mean, I would be embarrassed at this. And then uh, you start pouring perfume. I mean, like, what is she doing but also, what is Jesus doing by accepting this? He, he should be brushing her off. Go away, you pesky woman. I don't want this kind of thing here. And Jesus allows it. And so, verse 39, when the Pharisee who'd invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him because she's a sinner. Like, in other words, we know that she isn't really welcome. How come Jesus doesn't realise this? And that introduces this question today. Um, how embarrassed are you by people that Jesus welcomes? Or to put it another way, does the church put you off Jesus? Uh, just think of, I don't know, around this room now, you probably don't want to say, because that would be embarrassing. But are there people that you get, oh, they're not really my kind of person at Grace Church Greenwich? You know, I, I like the church, except for, I really hope I can avoid so-and-so. And of course, one of the things about a bigger church is you, you can sort of avoid the people you don't like, can't you? So when we go down for tea and coffee, you can hang out with the people that are your sorts of people, and you can cross the room if you see the person that isn't your sort of person coming. Um, and how do you feel about the fact that those people are, are welcome and they're included and they might have different politics from you or, or different views from you? Or they might be from different background from you or a different ethnic group or a different, they, uh, they, might have, uh, they might vote differently from you. Or there just could be bigger reasons than that. This could be someone and you know that they've lived quite a messed up life. They're a sinner. Um, how come everyone's welcoming us if they're normal? Do you not realize what a weirdo they are? Um, I remember very clearly when I went to when I was at university, there was a talk on what does Jesus think of the church, and it was a a, a talk for uh, people who weren't Christians, just to, who were investigating the Christian faith. And the the guy doing the talk made the point that often the people are put off by the church. And he there's this great quote from C.S. Lewis, the um, the author who became a Christian in later life. And he said, I, I, he became a Christian because he loved Jesus. And then he suddenly realized to his horror that he was going to have to join the church. And, and he writes, I suddenly realized I was up against all the wearisome botherness of it all. He says, of all the instruments of the orchestra, I like the organ least. <laughs> and, then, and he goes on to say, not only that, but all the really awkward people in the church. 
And uh, the, the guy doing this talk went on to say the point that because the entrance requirement for being part of the church is knowing that you need forgiveness, that, that's the requirement to come here. That, that's, that's his welcome here. People who know they need forgiveness. And if you pass that entrance requirement, you're welcome. He said, if that's the entrance requirement, all sorts of people are going to get in. <laughs> like, can you imagine what a low bar this is? You know, at least some of you are studying at Trinity Laban, um, music and dance. Okay, at least there's a, there's a reassuringly minimum standard there, isn't it? You have, to, you have auditions. You don't have people at Trinity Laban, I guess, who sing flat um, or who play the trombone out of tune. You know, th this is a, it's a high stand. It's a kind of elite entry. Greenwich is full of elite entry kind of groups, isn't it? If you're, if you've got a higher degree, you're welcome here. Or if you went for the right school, you're welcome here. Uh, and in church, if you need forgiveness, you're welcome here. All sorts of people are going to get in on that basis. And this Pharisee is embarrassed. It's frankly embarrassing that Jesus doesn't realize what kind of woman this is. I mean, if he were a prophet, surely he would know. And he wouldn't want to associate with her. Uh, the, the question of whether Jesus is a prophet has actually been the key question rumbling through these last couple of chapters. You may remember that we've seen it. Um, so Jesus does this incredible miracle where he raises from the dead a boy at a funeral. Uh, and they say, the crowd say, surely a great prophet has come into the world. And then uh, this verse, uh, chapter, where are we? chapter 7, verse 16, a great prophet has arisen among us. And then John the Baptist, who was pretty much the most famous prophet of the day, the most famous preacher. John the Baptist ends up backing Jesus and following Jesus because of his, when he hears about his miracles. And, and Jesus says, well, John the Baptist was the, the greatest prophet that there was going in the Old Testament. But anyone who's a Christian is even greater than him. Because here comes someone who's even more than a prophet. You know, Jesus, on the basis of the miracles he does, he's got to be from God. And then Simon says, no, no, on the basis of the people he hangs out with, he can't be from God. Yeah, God wouldn't want people like this woman pouring tears over his feet. He cannot be a prophet. And then, then Jesus tells a little parable, and it's in verse 40. Jesus answering... I love that as well, by the way. Jesus, Simon hasn't actually said anything. He just said to himself, I guess, in his head, probably, silently. Um, and then Jesus answers. That's kind of scary in itself, isn't it? If you're having a conversation and then you say something in your head and then the other person answers you. <laughs> okay, Jesus knows what he's thinking. Um, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I've got something to tell you, to something to say to you. And he says, okay, go on then. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. 500 denarii is more than a year's wages, so like 30,000 pounds, something like that. Um, uh, the other one, 50. So this is like a month's wages, so um, way less. Which of the, uh, when they could not pay, he cancelled the debt of both. Which of them do you think will love him more? Simon said, well, the one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. And Jesus says, correct. I mean, yeah, it's kind of obvious parable, isn't it? If you, you know, you're, you're in debt by, you know, your entire, um, at the end of your university, you know, your student loan puts you about this much in debt, probably. And then the bank manager says, oh, I'm a nice kind of guy. So, you know what? Let's just say that your debt is zero. Uh, you're going to be really fond of that bank manager, probably. Whereas if somebody else, you know, you owe them an oyster fare because you borrowed their oyster card when yours had run out and you owe them, what is it, £2.80? You go, oh, thanks. Oh, cheers, but it's a, sm it's a small thing, but thanks. Okay, it's, it's kind of obvious. Massive debts forgiven is a very rare thing. Wow. Like a whole, a year's salary, and he's just said, oh, don't worry about it. Wow. Compared with a few pence. Then comes the, the punchline. Run, turning the woman to, uh, turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I love that as well. Do you see this woman? Jesus 
Of course we see her. The question is, do you see this woman? Like the one who's been, since she arrived, pouring perfume on your feet and washing your, your feet with her hair? I mean, like, frankly, who can ignore it? He says, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Um, it's hard for us to understand, but it's, it's kind of the etiquette in the first century when someone's traveled um, and they, you know, they're wearing sandals and the roads are dusty and their feet are met. You, you offer them a chance to, to wash their feet. Um, it's like saying to somebody, you know, do you want to use the bathroom in a British house? Um, to, to invite someone to dinner and to not allow them to use the loo would be quite rude. I mean, it's that, it's that sort of thing. You haven't done anything about my feet. This woman has washed my feet with her hair. Verse 45, you gave me no kiss. Again, it's sort of expected in the first century that you greet somebody. It would be like, you know, someone reaches out their hand to give you a handshake and then you sort of turn your back on them. So that's, it's rude not to give a kiss, not to give a welcome. You didn't even welcome me. But this woman, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. You didn't anoint my head with oil. Again, another cultural expectation. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. In other words, what Jesus is saying, he's kind of turning the tables. And if he says, if you want to talk about who's being embarrassing, Simon, it's not this woman. It's you. Uh, you have treated me with complete rudeness and contempt since I arrived. And that is frankly embarrassing. That's what Jesus does at these dinner parties, by the way. He's, he's not just rude for the sake of it. He just keeps turning the tables. So they're cross with Jesus about something. And he case, irony of ironies, you know, hypocrite. Let's flip it around. And you're the ones who are behaving terribly here. Simon, it's so rude of you. It's frankly embarrassing. And then Jesus applies the parable. I tell you, verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. It's a great little saying, and it's worth just remembering these words. He who's forgiven much loves much. He who is forgiven little loves little. It's, it's the debt, you see. It's like she was a year's salary in debt to God. And more than that, she was a lifetime of mistakes in debt to God. And God cancelled it. He said, oh, let's, let's call it quits. Let's... Let's write it off. Let's say that you're not in debt at all. Let's forgive you. That, that's the amazing thing about forgiveness. It's like having debt cancelled. I don't know whether anyone here struggles with serious debt. Um, it, it's a very terrifying thing, I think. It, it, it grips people and imprisons people. Um, it, it takes away all hope from you. You know, Whatever you do, however much you work, you can never pay off the, the interest of getting more and you're going to be evicted from your house and uh, you might lose your family, and it's just it's just awful thing. And Jesus chooses that as a metaphor. It's, it's like that to be in debt with God. Uh, you're in the red. You've blown it. There's nothing you can do that will compensate. And even if you try harder to pay it off, you're some, somehow the situation is just getting worse. And then along comes God, and he says, I'll forgive you. It means let's just say that you're not in debt at all that all the terrible things you've done in the past, I won't count when I weigh your life. Uh, let's put you up in the black. Wow. And Jesus says, well, that, that's why she loves me. Because, <laughs> you know, she's, yeah, I know she's a sinful woman, by the way. You know, you said that I can't be a prophet because I didn't know what kind of woman this is. I do know what kind of woman she is. I know everything about her and I've forgiven her. And that's why she loves me. Um, it, it's slightly the other way around than what we expect, isn't it? It says, I used to get stuck with this. Her sins are many are forgiven for she loved much. It sounds like she's forgiven because she loved much. Does that mean her love earned her forgiveness? It can't be that way around, can it? Because in the parable that Jesus tells, you get the debt forgive, forgiven, and then because the debt's cancelled, that you then love. And so why is it the wrong way around? It seems the wrong way around in... Verse 47, and I was reading about this and someone says it's like to say, oh, what's the weather like? And you say, oh, it's raining.
because the windows are wet. I mean, the windows being wet is not the cause of it raining. It's just the way that you know that it's raining. It's raining because the windows are wet. Um, she has been forgiven a lot because she loved much. In other words, her love is the evidence of how much she's had forgiven, just like the rain on the windows is the evidence of it raining outside. You can tell that she and Jesus have past history, you might say. I mean, after all, that's why she's there, isn't it? Because she, she finds out, verse 37, that Jesus is in town and he's gone to this dinner party. And so she crashes it, basically, with her jar of perfume. She just wants to find Jesus and, and show him how much she loves him because of what he's previously already done for her, cancelling her debt and forgiving her sins. Whereas Simon, the Pharisee, he doesn't think he's got much that he needs forgiven at all. I mean, that doesn't mean he's right. I mean, he's got, you know, self-righteousness, rudeness to Jesus, um, being condescending towards this woman. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't being nice about Simon, but he thinks anyway, I'm in the black. You know, I'm a religious, important, self-righteous person. What's the problem? I certainly don't need to be forgiven. And if I do need to be forgiven, oh, it's a few pence here and there. You know, little trivial things that God will have to overlook. And so Jesus says, that's probably why you don't love me very much then, Simon, isn't it? Because she who's forgiven much, loves much. He who's forgiven little, loves little. You see, it's a turning upside down of the who's rude, uh, who's welcomed, who's in, who's out. Everything is flipped over. And then the punchline, I love it. Jesus, sort of, I love that she gets the last word, so... Or rather, Jesus to her is the last word. So Simon, I guess he thinks he's the most important person at the dinner party. He's the host. And Jesus basically rebukes him. And then anyway, enough of you, Simon. And then he turns to the woman. And she's the one he's actually interested in at the end of the, the episode. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, these are very beautiful words if you're conscious that you're a sinner today. If you are here in church knowing, I feel like a fraud. What they call it, imposter syndrome. What am I doing in church? Because if people knew the sort of secrets of my life and the things I've done and that my history and that they wouldn't want to be sitting next to me in church. And if Jesus were a prophet, if he knew, he wouldn't really want to be welcoming me to church. And Jesus says, no, I am a prophet. I'm mean, more than a prophet. And I do know about you and what you've done. And you are welcome in church. In fact, your sins are forgiven. Your debts are cancelled. Your faith in me, your trust in me has saved you. Go in peace. I mean, every one of those phrases is wonderful, isn't it? Your sins are forgiven, one. Your faith has rescued you, saved you, two. Go in peace, three. Peace doesn't mean sort of go tranquilly, you know, peace, man. It means go in reconciliation. Go without any problems remaining between God and you. Go with being friends with me rather than hiding things from me. It's restoration. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I, therefore, if you're here this morning and you're feeling like a fraud because of your sin, know that Jesus knows about it. And if you trust him with it, you're welcome. You're forgiven. He cancels your debt. You're at peace with God. But what I love about this episode, and it's so clever of Jesus, is there's, there might be other people here, or other people looking at the live stream. I don't know who you are, because I can't see you. Uh, hello. Who are thinking, oh, this is, very, this is very weak and wet and pathetic, and this is just what I thought about Jesus. He's there for inadequate people who can't get their life together. 
and all those people at Grace Church Greenwich. I mean, look at look at them, frankly. And I don't think I really need to be involved with that. And this has a message for those people as well. Do you realise how rude you're being to the God who made you? <laughs> Do you realise that your behaviour at the dinner is frankly more embarrassing than hers? And so this is an episode, it just catches everyone, doesn't it? That, that all the people who know they need forgiveness and are amazed at it, and all the people who don't think they need forgiveness and are insulted by it. And Jesus has a message for all of us, whichever of those two groups we're in. But then um, let me apply it. And I've put these three coffee questions, but I'm going to ask them now, and then we can ask them again when we go downstairs. But here are the questions. How much do you love Jesus? Now, are you here at church just because you know, it's a habit um, or it's the thing that you have always done, church on, church on Sunday, uh, or because you've know you have got friends here and you like to see them each week or because you enjoyed the singing or whatever, or you want to be taught the Bible, or are you here because you love Jesus? You, you love him. You just want to hang around him and his people and know about him and hear his voice, and that's why you're here. Oh, of course, whether or not you love Jesus is probably connected to the second question. How much he, has he forgiven you? Or how sure are you, how confident are you at the, the forgiveness you've received from him? And it might be that you're here and you're not forgiven because you've never trusted Jesus with your sin. But this woman has, and so he says to her, your faith has saved you. And if you're conscious, as I am, of your shortcomings, the things that other people in the room would be shocked at, but Jesus isn't shocked at because he already knows about them, and you believe that he has forgiven you and cancelled your debt, I predict you're going to love him a lot. <laughs> and if you don't love him very much, well, maybe like Simon, you, we, you just got no idea of what your debt is actually like and how much you need him. And then um, final question, how embarrassed are you at the other people he chooses to forgive? That's another test, isn't it? If, if you think um, that you're a little bit better than some of the other people at Grace Church Greenwich, look at how socially awkward she is. Thank goodness I've got some basic social skills. Uh, look at how tone deaf he is. Apologies to the music students if you if you uh, sit next to me. But you know the, uh, or I don't know. Maybe you know some secrets about someone's past here. Oh, he shouldn't really be here. She's not really welcome. It sort of ends up saying a lot about you, actually, frankly, rather than about that person. You're a bit Pharisee, like you're a bit like Simon. You're, you seem not to realise that Jesus is in the business of welcoming and forgiving and, and cancelling debts. And maybe you don't realise what a big debt you've got. You know, the thing about uh, an organisation whose entrance requirement is forgiveness is all sorts of people are going to get in. And so if you've trusted in Jesus, you, you are welcome here. And this is for you. And by the way, so is anybody else on that basis. And let's not be selective in who we invite to church. Oh, I couldn't invite them because they're too Muslim. Well, we've got ex-Muslims here at church who've come to find Jesus. Welcome. I couldn't invite, invite, invite her because she's too gay. Oh, we've got same-sex attractive people here at church if she comes to find Jesus. Um, I can't invite him because he's too woke. I can't invite her because she's too loud. I can't invite, and yeah, add whatever difficult adjective you want. Invite them because they're welcome on this basis. If they come with a debt that needs forgiving and they trust in Jesus to do it, he will forgive them and they will love him and they're welcome. I'm going to leave a pause and then we're going to pray together.